Special needs. Now, the documents clearly spelt out how children with special needs ought to be handled in the various communities in which they live for them to realize their full potentials in education. Now, it also spells out the objectives and strategies and techniques which will be used to achieve the needed outcomes to ensure equitable society for all children. And like I mentioned today, our theme for our second national dialogue is fostering ownership of the inclusive education policy to promote compliance. I will also introduce some persons who are here to make today's um, program a success. And first of all, let me mention that we have some Individuals who work here with us at Media General and they are the management level. And I would first call on Mr. Bennett Kujo Honuche. He is the acting CFO and he is with Media General. Can you please give us a wave? <laughs> well, there's someone sitting very close to him who I would mention shortly, but uh, because he has a role to play. And joining me up here, I do have um, two wonderful women who have made a lot of impact here in our country, Ghana. And I, I, I'm sure you can see someone doing the interpretation here because it's all about inclusiveness. So we're leaving no one behind. And on my far left, I would introduce Ms. Ms. Ketrude Ofoewa Fafuame, and she is a global advocacy advisor on social inclusion, site savers international, and a member of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability. You're welcome, ma'am. And another person who's sitting very close to her, I'm sure she's a familiar face on television, and you've always seen her talk about <laughs> a lot of issues. And she is in the person of Dr. Esther Ofei Abuaji. She's a chairperson, steering committee, Star Ghana Foundation. You're welcome. <laughs> we wouldn't have been here without the support of Star Ghana Foundation. You're welcome, and we're grateful for your time. So let me first um, go ahead and say that you're welcome to our home, but there's someone who's going to do the introduction proper. And he is in the person of Mr. Francis Doku. He's a general manager, digital, that's MG, Media General, digital, and MG, that's Media General Radio. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, this is for me to welcome you to Adesawe, uh, as we call our purposes. Adesa means uh, story in Ga. So this is the house of story. So welcome to the house of story. <laughs> and uh, I welcome you on behalf of the group CEO, Madam Beatrice Ajman Abe, and the executive management of Media General. It is heartwarming to know that TV3, which is a subsidiary of the Media General Group, started its journey with Star Ghana in 2013. Over the years, this partnership has impacted positively on the lives of the marginalized and deprived individuals and communities across the country. Undoubtedly, many communities, which includes women, children, and persons with disability, have witnessed qualitative improvement in education in health service delivery due to what we've done with Mission Ghana on TV3, which is a human interest driven segment on uh, News 360, our prime news. There have been documentaries, news reportage, and features that have become a staple of our cherished viewers and policy makers. It is therefore not surprising that duty bearers have become responsive to the feedback that straddled the lives that Mission Ghana has touched. At the heart of TV3's mission is the implementation of the inclusive education policy. Ladies and gentlemen, today's event is themed 
fostering ownership of the inclusive education policy to promote compliance. It is a demonstrable evidence of media generous commitment to building an equitable society that prioritizes the needs of all persons. Our conviction is that children with disability must have unhindered access to education. This has informed the objective that is amplifying the voice of the voiceless through compelling educative and information news reportage. It is imperative to mention at this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, that the invaluable support of the National Education Campaign Coalition, uh, we, who have been worthy partners in promoting accountability and responsiveness in inclusive education. And I think that it is good that we give them a round of applause at this point. <laughs> Our distinguished resource persons, invited guests, and the general public have also contributed immensely to this dialogue with a collective goal of influencing policy at the national level. I believe this platform will shape the implementation process and offer a relief and respite to children with disability in basic schools. It is important to know that this occasion wouldn't have been possible without the priceless support of Star Ghana Foundation, which, contributes, which continues to support Mission Ghana on TV3. Star Ghana Foundation is the pivot around which Mission Ghana revolves, and they do deserve commendation. Thank you so much. <laughs> we remain hopeful that civil society organizations, corporate Ghana, and other agencies will continue to support Star Ghana Foundation in their quest to fund such important initiatives as TV3's activities on Mission Ghana. So thank you so much, and welcome once again to Adisawe. Enjoy our premises. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Francis Doku, and he is the General Manager, MG Digital and MG Radio. With that welcome address given, obviously it's, it tells us that we can start our program now. But globally, there is a concern, and the concern is about inclusion. It's just, it's just not a matter for Ghana, but it's a worldwide problem, and the Solution is to, for stakeholders to work together and bridge the gap. And they're doing their best, but is it enough? Here in Ghana in 2016, we took the initiative. Three years on, what have we achieved? Are we proud of our results in relation to inclusiveness? And there's this gentleman who is very focal and um, very loud, I should say, in that quote, not in a negative sense, but he's actually concerned when it comes to matters of education. And he's one who's also knowledgeable in that area. With a round of applause, shall we welcome Mr. Kofi Asari, he's Executive Council Chair of the Ghana National Education Campaign Coalition. Nick. Thank you. Good morning, um, all stakeholders here gathered. On behalf of the Executive Council, of the Ghana National Education Campaign Coalition. I am happy to welcome you formally here to this forum. As we all are aware, the government of Ghana committed to the SDGs, and more specifically the SDG 4, which we are particularly interested here. To enable Ghana achieve SDG 4, it is imperative for all to be able to assess quality education without any hindrance. All meaning all children in Ghana without geographical inhibitions, without health inhibitions, without any disadvantage occasioned by socioeconomic factors, and more particularly without any inhibitions provided by disabilities. And so the coalition, as part of its aim of ensuring that there is free access to quality education for all Ghanaian children, entered into this partnership with Star Ghana to advocate for a more inclusive education for all policy in Ghana. We have gathered here because it's past three years since the 
inclusive education policy of Ghana was passed. But as usual, we find that it is always difficult for our government to take full ownership of policies that they themselves enact. And it makes it so difficult to implement a policy which lacks or which the which governments normally do not have the full or adequate political will to implement. We've seen so many policies in this country, very beautiful policies on the table, being aptly implemented in other countries, but struggling to take off in Ghana. And so when we heard that the IE policy had been passed, the prayer was that this should be an exception to most of the, the policies that are only good for the shelves. Unfortunately, the policy is still struggling to take off. The coalition observes that um, about 25% or so, a quarter of district assemblies or key stakeholders from the districts are barely aware of the existence of the policy. If you walk into any district assembly in Ghana, you are likely not to have key stakeholders at the district level having a full appreciation of what the inclusive policy entails. But the fact is that education is a business for the district assemblies. And education is not just a business for the genius or the MOE. Because ensuring that there are assessment centers that screens and identifies children with special disabilities at the right time and recommends them to their appropriate agencies. The fact that education, inclusive, inclusive education involves health sector, education sector, local government, and all other agencies under the MMDAs requires that these metropolitan municipal and assemblies must appreciate the policy before they can actualize the policy. And so if we are at a point where common appreciation of the policy is even a challenge, then it means that we have a long way to go. We are yet to take off. We are not even taxing. And so this forum has been convened to try and then secure the missing commitments from our duty bearers, from our policy makers, in respect of funding and engineering a very, very workable inclusive education policy that ensures that come 2030, Ghana would have achieved the objectives under SDG 4. And so, armed with this objective and our enthusiasm and commitment, I want to formally welcome you to the Inclusive Education um, Forum. And I hope that your contributions and your suggestions would be taken much seriously by government. And we also hope that government will welcome every decision we take here and implement it so that the next time we meet to review our progress, it would be a positive story. I thank you once again, and I wish all of us a very engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kufi Asari. And I mentioned earlier on that he is so knowledgeable when it comes to matters of education. Thank you, sir. So one of the things I picked from his presentation or statement was that implementers or stakeholders at the local level either have little or no knowledge about this policy. But the question is, what do we do or how do we bridge that gap as a country when we have a policy and it's um, been three years? Is what do we do? What's the way forward? And that's why we're here this morning. There's been a lot of narrative when it comes to inclusiveness, but how well are, have we fared as a country? What are the lapses? What is the way forward? And can we even achieve the targets we've set for ourselves? And also this morning, we have been joined by someone I will introduce shortly to you. He is uh, Mr. Kinsley Affle, our Chief Operations Officer at Media General. Hello, sir, and thanks for joining us. So our conversation is still on, and we're going to have a panel discussion this morning. I mentioned them early on and touched on some of their expertise and they're very knowledgeable when it comes to matters like this. But first, we'll start with Dr. Esther Ofea Boaji. She's the chairperson, steering committee, Star Ghana Foundation. And I also said that this program wouldn't have been possible without Star Ghana. So Star Ghana, we say a very big thank you. Shall we appreciate Star Ghana with a clap? <laughs> 
And then also, so what will she be talking about this morning? She'll be sharing with us her knowledge on how to strengthen compliance with the inclusive education policy by local government structures. Our speaker, the one who just ended his statement, mentioned that it is a challenge. What can we do and what is the way forward? You have 10 minutes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, management of um, our hosts, so that I don't get it wrong, let me just say our hosts. Um, there is somebody from Star Ghana to come and appreciate you later, so I won't steal her thunder. But we are excited to be here and to commend uh, TV3 on the excellent work that's been done in relation to Mission Ghana. We're deeply appreciative. But to the subject under consideration, that is the inclusive education policy and how to strengthen compliance by local government uh, structures. As earlier speakers have noted, the issue of inclusive uh, education is an issue of rights. The 1992 Constitution gives that. Ghana has made very various commitments to leaving no one behind. By signing on to the SDGs, we did that. So it's important to get it right. But if we look in the policy, there are at least 18 categories of potential beneficiaries. Uh, the policy does well, listing a whole range of disabilities, as well as uh, persons or children, uh, not only with physical, mental, and emotional disabilities, but those who are economically exploited, nomadic, displaced, or disadvantaged. The emphasis on the issue of inclusion emphasis on the issue of inclusion. Now, if you look in the policy and its objectives and strategies, in all of the four areas, even though the policy makes a specific provision for what uh, Metropolitan Municipal and District Assemblies, or MMDAs, are supposed to do, I want to argue that a lot of these strategies impact on local authorities and the people who live and work with them. Because they are the level of government that people encounter in their daily lives. So that it's about them. It's not just about what they've been given to do, but it's about them to take an interest. For instance, if you sign responsibilities to traditional authorities, they live in localities. If you assign responsibilities to communities and PTAs and school management committees, they live within district um, assembly jurisdictions or within their purview. And therefore, it's important to see how they're involved. Uh, policy one, for instance, uh, policy objective one, which is about uh, re uh, adapting and improving systems and structures and issues around assessment centers and physical infrastructural designs of existing schools are very much the business of assemblies. As is policy two, policy three, and um, all of that up to policy four. Uh, Madam moderator, uh, you can see that a lot of the implementation arrangements expects considerable amounts of input from the Ghana Education Service, for instance, and it refers to working within its decentralized structures and uh, all of those kinds of things. One argument I want to make this morning is that we need to be inclusive even in the approach. You see, it is true that it's the purview of the Ghana Education Service and the Ministry of Education and the Inclusive Education Unit, but they can't do it alone. And it's very important that they are also proactive and engaging in and sharing. The policy assigns specific roles to the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, but my focus this morning is on the assemblies. And in the policy, uh, the roles that have been identified for the assemblies include supporting the community-based rehabilitation program, ensuring equitable access to public resources and inclusiveness in decision-making relevant for this policy, being obliged to ensure equitable access and therefore the policy requires it to mainstream inclusive education issues in the medium-term development plans and also facilitating allocation of resources from under the common fund 
towards the education of persons with disabilities. So it's expected that assemblies will be focal points for policy coordination, ensure implementation of inclusive education, provide local level monitoring, evaluation, and review, and create platforms for experience sharing and identifying good practices. Again, there are various areas, for instance, where the policy makes provision in monitoring and evaluation, looking at quarterly and annual reviews, right down to the school and the community levels, where I think overtly and maybe indirectly, assemblies must be seen or must be encouraged to take an active role. So that quite a lot has happened, or if we will reflect on what has happened since the edu inclusive education policy uh, was launched, there's been the environment within which assemblies live and function has also changed. For instance, the passage of Act 936, which revises the Act 462 Local Government Act on which the policy is based. And it is imperative that uh, we look at all of these instruments and see how they provide opportunities for pushing the agenda that we want. I was privileged to be in a meeting in May where the uh, Inclusive Education Unit identified some of the challenges to the implementation of the policy. They talked about weak systems and capacities, inadequate resource um, allocation, and persisting inability or inaccessibility of school facilities. They talked about weak databases, large class sizes impeding responsive service delivery. They wanted, or the way forward they proposed included strengthening institutional capacity, mobilizing requisite resources, building capacities, and improving infrastructure. So what does this mean for assemblies? If assemblies are going to contribute the implementation of the policy and address the gaps, first of all, like others have said before me, and I think uh, Mr. Sari and Mr. Doku referred to it, we need to educate assemblies. Assembly staff, functionaries, and members. Not only assemb but functionaries, the, the technical and bureaucratic people, as well as assembly members. They should own the uh, um, policy. Um, there was a big argument of whether the policy had been made available at the local level. <coughs> it is true that the policy is um, online. I mean, you can access it there. But who knows about it? Who knows it's there to go and get it? Secondly, <coughs> excuse me, policies have to be reviewed at some point. We need the uh, um, ministry, the Ghana Education Service, and the unit responsible to involve all these players in the review of the policy. How has it gone? To get the worldview from their perspective so that they own it and we know about what it is that they have experienced with the implementation of it. I also want to propose that we need to strengthen the technical capacities of the social development department. That's where community development and social welfare come together at the district level. This is not for the district education unit and the diets or the district educa um, uh, inclusive education teams alone. These people are the people who go into homes, who know what the issues are, who know what the attitudes are. So we need to strengthen their technical capacities. As we try to adapt and be innovative, we need to familiarize works, departments, and other entities about what is standard and what is acceptable for making disability-friendly and accessible um, uh, facilities. Indeed, we also have to forge linkages with the institutions at the district level, the National Commission for Civic Education, the ISD, the Information Services Department, we need to encourage them, join hands together with the media to help to create wide awareness. But, you know, the policy talks about mainstreaming um, uh, um, inclusive education in the medium term plan. It needs to go beyond that. Annual work plans. How can we adapt and um, make sure that the areas that have potential for promoting IE can um, promote that? We talk about mobilization of resources, the local private sector, the artisans and so on. How can we encourage them to give something to facilitating inclusive education? There is also the need to encourage 
uh, assemblies to do an annual review meeting. The policy talks about it at the national and other levels, but at the district level, they should ask themselves, how are we performing? How are we doing on inclusive education? I also want us to look at the new 936, as I said. It requires assemblies to do public communication. How, what are the provisions for sign language interpretation? What are the provisions for making venues and localities accessible to people, uh, persons with physical disabilities? And you know, the use of you know, visuals and so on, that can help people who don't have access to the language in which we normally do this. Madam, I want to say just something, that there's a, there are larger underlying issues that need to be forced. And I want to talk about it for about a couple of minutes and wind this up. You see, I talked about collaborative orientation. The Ministry of Education, the Ghana Education Service, must, you know, engage. You know, a lot of the action is top down. A lot of the action is about TEF. Information dissemination, they need to engage horizontally and vert vertically as well as horizontally so that people own um, or these entities own this. Local authorities also must go beyond 3% of the common fund for persons with disabilities. That one is the minimum. You know, these people are citizens of the localities who have access to common fund or who have equal right to common fund resources. And we need to go beyond that 3% to make sure that th their issues are supported. There must be clear leadership support. I want to see MCs or municipal metropolitan chief executives coordinating directors, saying, owning, talking, supporting, publicly, stating, committing, you know, so that when there's clear leadership support, there'll be encouragement for owning these issues. Inclusive education is about managing social change. The prejudices, the attitudes, the discrimination that has reinforced people's exclusion won't go overnight. It needs investment of time and commitment. It needs the collaboration that I've talked about. And it needs ownership. And therefore, if we keep these discussions going at the national level and at the subnational levels, we shall make headway. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Esther Ofei Abuaji. And some of her pointers, if I can reiterate, is that she touched on the approach. And I, I, I like that because she did indicate that although we are concentrating on the local government level, there are individuals and there are human beings there. So we have to own it as Ghanaians and ensure that the policy is implemented effectively. She also mentioned accessibility, weak data, and then also building and strengthening capacities. And then also one very important thing is um, going beyond the 3% common fund, which she believes is the minimum. We can do a lot more as a country. Thank you so much. Let's appreciate her once again, <laughs> Dr. Esther Ofea Abwaji. Doc, I'll be very grateful if you can kindly hand over your microphone to Mrs. Gertrude Ofoewa for me. And um, she is very special to us as well. She's going to be talking to us about an interesting topic which is best practices in promoting inclusion from the national and global perspectives. And she is um, the Global Advocacy Advisor on Social Inclusion, Site Savers International, and a member of the UN Committee on Rights and Persons with Disability. Mrs. Gertrude Ofoiwa Fafuame, you have the microphone. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, management, Madam resource person who is also my auntie, so family here, <laughs> all protocol observed. I'm to talk about the best practices bringing from the national and global perspectives. But before I go on, Allow me to share this story. Because there are many of us in this country who still do not think 
inclusive education is a way to go. And that inclusive education, inclusive education is possible, feasible, and workable. I, Geti Oforua, has been an example of an informal inclusive education process from 1970 to 1975. I stress informal because at that time, the policies we are talking about were non-existent. And very few people understood what inclusive education was. I was in the Ghana secondary school. I could not read from the blackboard. I could not read from the textbooks. I could only read my own handwriting, which I put in large prints. It was a struggle. But here I am. Here I am today. And I'll give the tribute to my late father, Dr. Edward Osumenu, who we are burying on the 31st of August this month. My mom, Mama Vic, the Osumani family, the Newman family, the Hansen family, friends, and the system, Ghana Secondary School, and all who made it possible. Friends, it is possible. Yes, and because I believe in it, that's why even though I'm bereaved, I'm here to demonstrate the power of inclusive education. Thank you for this time. So, globally, an estimated millions of over 65 of children in secondary, lower secondary, have disabilities. Close to half of them are out of school. Remember, we do have special residential schools, but half of this over 60 million are out of school. 42% of the primary level and the 56 at the lower secondary level, they are out of school. And this is according to a 2017 report by UNICEF. Also according to the World Bank, excluding children with disabilities from attaining quality education has an adverse economic impact at family, community, and country level. Of course, if I didn't go to school, Ghana would not have had the first disability expert at the UN had to go to school in formal inclusive education. So it's true, Ghana would have lost, my family would have lost, and community as well. The root of inclusive education comes from the process of disability inclusion, including the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, who has a dedicated article and related articles stressing the need of inclu inclusive education, inclusive quality education. Ghana has ratified that, and as we heard earlier, we also have our inclusive education policy. Our Disability Act, even though not compliant with the convention, still has relevant issues on inclusive education. So these require government to ensure inclusive and equitable education at all levels, and also to provide lifelong learning. I will discuss some barriers, some of which might have been mentioned already, but we need to hit it as an for no baby in here. So we'll repeat it. It's important to us. And then we'll also look at some good practices. 
And we'll conclude with a number of guidelines, some of which have been mentioned by earlier speakers. As we have said earlier, in the literal sense, it means persons educating alongside in the mainstream, not necessarily special school, not segregated, not sit there and later come and join, no. Children with disabilities should long learn alongside in regular schools. And to accomplish this, schools must be accessible, not only physical, information, communication, very important. Teachers, as I said earlier, equipped with the skills, understanding, and knowledge. In fact, I will spread attitude, the attitude that is required. So it requires making deep and more systemic changes, regardless of the situation, as my earlier speaker said, to reach this level. There is a need for significant cultural, social, and budgetary allocations. And some of the barriers that impede access include the lack of disaggregated data. So there may be data, but I'm talking about disaggregated data, disability disaggregated data. So we know the quantum of the issue. Because it affects the programming and interventions without knowing the quantum of the issue and strategically working towards them. The lack of political will, lift service, we will do, we don't see on the implementation. And the capacity and the knowledge in implementing the rights And as I said earlier, teacher training is important. We have talked about the inappropriate and inadequate funding mechanisms, but it's also because of the approach. We don't use the integrated approach. So it seems to stand out like it's a big challenge, too big and too high a mountain to overcome and it affects our implementation. And also, we do not provide incentives and reasonable accommodation. Allow me to send a minute about reasonable accommodation. The difference between accessibility and reasonable accommodation. So for us to be here, there is a barrier of the steps is a physical accessibility. But for me to be here, I could climb the steps, but I need this equipment which I'm reading from. It's my need. Another blind person or visually impaired person who might require a different equipment. So that I need this is my reasonable accommodation. And the other person requiring the other kind is that person's reasonable accommodation. So if I'm slow, I need more time. If the other person is not slow, he might need, need a different approach. So a reasonable accommodation is individual need that complement accessibility to enable us achieve quality, inclusive education for learners. We, uh, we wish to stress the interministerial approach and use a Kenya example of 
working towards an issue, maybe we may be able to learn something from it. So, what is the issue? How do we know it? We need a research. So at a point in time, Kenya instituted a task force and it was to review the education of learners with disabilities vis-a-vis -vis those without disabilities. The analysis showed that for every individual child, there is a need to arrange the capitation grant, the grant that government gives to education, the schools needs to be reorganized. So the child with dis without disability takes one part, and the child with disability takes four parts of it. So when analysis is done in the school, Kokomemle Primary A, there are four children with disabilities in Kokomlemele Primary A among the 500 children, and therefore, four times for those four individuals, the capitation grant from the government was what would be provided. And it goes through the school's process and taking to be able to take care of the child. That child need not to be in a special school. Kokumemlemle, primary A, they receive that funds. That was not even in month, not enough. In 2018, a stakeholder workshop was also again to review the process and to improve what is being done. And this has renewed interest in the situation by the government, civil society, including organizations of persons with disabilities, foundations like Star Ghana, NGOs, bilateral partners. So now they have a basket funding and different agencies are now pledging according to their strategy, what they put into the basket to support improvement in the implementation of inclusive education in Kenya. There is even a further step is ongoing, which is differentiating the need because not all persons with disabilities are the same. And not all the issues are the same. I just explained what reasonable accommodation is. So they are looking at what it takes with different categories. And that process is ongoing as we talk. Ghana can do this. And Ghana can do more than this. We can take the lead in Africa. Thank you so, so much, Mrs. Gertrude Ofoira Feforme. Make it a lot more louder, please. She's indeed an asset to Ghana. Not just, um, she's achieved a feat, not just for herself as an individual, but for the country, Ghana. And she mentioned that Ghana can do it, and Ghana will do it. We should do it as a country. It's not impossible. If others have done it, we can indeed do it. And some of the things she touched on is the political will. She also touched on accessibility, the attitude required, the deep and more systematic changes needed, and also the need for significant cultural and um, budgetary allocation. She also touched on diversity, but in diversity in relation to disabilities. She believes that everybody must be given the opportunity. And she also shared her personal experiences with us. And I'm sure it will go a long way to impact uh, us as individuals as well. And um, we all have a role to play. That's a reminder for all of us. I love this part, which is the Orphan Forum. We have um, a full house here. 
made up of stakeholders and the relevant individuals to ensure that we have the change we need. And it's live on TV3. If you're watching us, um, you're watching the second TV3 network and Ghana National Education Campaign Coalition National Public Lecture on Inclusive Education. And um, I mentioned that we have two wonderful people up here who are very knowledgeable in relation to the subject we have. And they will be answering our questions. We also have people seated who will be answering questions. So we have our open forum session. So if you have a question, you have a contribution, you can just raise your hands and then we'll get going. So who's starting? All right. So I will come to you shortly. Let's go outside and then come back home. But you tell us your name and then your organization. I'm Rose Ofei. I teach at Presbyterian College of Education, Ekropon Equipum, and an ambassador for NEC. Thank you, presenters. Auntie Getty, I'm here. I'm proud of you. You are one of the people I always refer my children to look to as role model. Please, um, there are more others in the village. As I said, I'm a teacher at the college. However, there are others at the villages. In fact, uh, I chanced to have a student, um, somebody who has completed SHS since 2013. This guy excelled very well. However, due to his disability, the mother said he can't go further. So there are lots of the villages there who cannot assess education. And it was at a funeral that I met this guy. Had it not been that funeral, I wouldn't have met him. So it was last year that I met him and how to get him uh, to the uh, training college, it has been a help. More so, we are the only college that admits individuals with hearing impairment. When they are registering, even though they have given the chance, they don't have language, yet they are to get credits in English language. We have tried all that we can, even been to the ministries to talk it over. At least they should have a pass. As he, she said, that's the accommodation. And some attitude of us, some of us who are trained to be special educators, it's a hell. So I am pleading that opportunity will be given to the advocates so that we can go down there to talk for these individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, before we even take um, a contribution or a question, we'd be very grateful if you make it very brief so that others can also have the opportunity. But aside um, Madam Gertrude Oforiwa, who has shared her personal experience in relation to inclusiveness. We also have another wonderful individual here in the person of Matilda Abenega, who had a story shared on TV3 by my colleague Portia Gabo, and um, she has a success story. So I would want to call Matilda Abenega to also share a bit of her story with us and how she's benefited from inclusiveness. Matilda. Hello, Matilda. How are you? I'm pretty, thank you? Great to have you here. So would you want to share a bit about how you've also benefited from inclusiveness? I have benefited from inclusiveness. I went to a, pri a private school, but unfortunately, I end up in front of school. Due to lack of equipment for my BEC certificate, 
and I w <coughs> and I went to a special school, but when I went there, they did not help me, so I dropped out and um one of my church member who was who was uh, who was an headmaster came to my rescue and I did admitted me to school in form two. So I went and they registered me for the BEC and I wrote and I got admission to West African Senior High and I continued from there and I wrote my worthy and the result is in but the the card that will be used to check the results is not in. So when it comes, I will go in to check my results. Thank you. Thank you. And um I'm sure you had an experience. It was tough at the beginning, but we all need to understand what inclusiveness is. And like Dr. Esther Ofeabaji mentioned, it's not, we all need to own inclusiveness. It's not about just a local government. It's not an individual affair. But if I'm sure the headmaster who help Matilda or didn't understand if TV3 as a media organization through our mission program didn't understand the essence of inclusiveness, we wouldn't be celebrating Matilda's success story. So we all have a role to play. Do we have a rep from the Ministry of Local Government in here? Or Ministry of Gender? Or invited them, so we're hoping that they will show up before the program ends. But there's a lady on my left who wants to Speak to us, yes. So you mention your name, make it quite brief, and then your organization as well. Thank you, madam. I'm Safa Kokuma Bupumi, the founder of Enlightening and Empowering People with Disabilities in Africa. Thank you, Mama Esther and Auntie Getty. Um, my question is, I think it goes directly to Auntie Getty. I've been struggling to get data for some time now as you talk or you touch base with data. Are there some mechanisms on our level as Ghanaians in terms of collecting data on people with disabilities? I know for the UN level, we always quote their data that is in air. I just want to know as a researcher if there is any mechanism lying down there which is hidden. Thank you. All right, so would ask um, the question to be answered and then we'll take the next one. Okay. If you have a contribution, you can all you hand it over to, because she asked directly to. Thank you, Sefwa Kaur. Yes, um, we are getting an improved mechanism by using the Washington DC approach in the forthcoming census. So the previous one, we made an effort it wasn't so great. We are making it better. And the government systems, particularly the statistical department, are really collaborating with the National Council of Persons with Disability and Ghana Federation of Persons with Disabilities. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Evans, I'm sure you had your hand up, but he has the microphone. So, let him go and then we'll bring the microphone down to Evans. Yes, sir. Yeah, so thank you very much. My name is Eric Durna. I'm a member of the National Coalition, and I'm always happy to add that I'm somebody affected by a disability. Um, I just want to begin by saying thanks to Doc and then Madame for the uh, able manner in which you've actually enlightened us on issues around inclusive education. I just have some few things to observe very quick. The first has to do with uh, Doc's, uh, Madame's intro. In your introduction, you did mention that we have a list of up to about 18 groups when it comes to issues of inclusive education. But in all the conversations, not just only what you shared, even nationally, 
there's always a greatest temptation to focus on disability, persons with disability. That is great. Probably, I'm guessing that that is where the need is greatest. But what happens to the other saving thing? I guess even within there, some of them might be groups with disability. But I just want us to be very sure that there's national consensus that when it comes to inclusive education, the need is greatest around disability, and that is where the energy should be. Um, having said that, I just want to pick the key point from this forum, which is ownership and link to compliance. Do I get the understanding that um, compliance is possible where there are sanctions? If there are no sanctions, then compliance in most instances become uh, anything. Talking about compliance, I think somebody needs to be held accountable when things do not go well. And the same person needs to be held uh, in high esteem if, th if things go well, by way of uh, uh, more or less celebrating that person. I realize one of the major reasons why we seem not to be doing very well when it comes to the implementation of the inclusive education policy is that, yes, there are issues of compliance, but there seems to be nobody who is held accountable. Uh, maybe just to end by saying that I have the implementation plan with me here, five-year implementation plan. When you look at it, it's ending this year, 2019. So you ask yourself, so how much of that have we achieved? I just went to the costing, and I realized that we, it, the total amount was about 378 million Ghana cities, or $121 million. So one may ask, how much of that have we been able to mobilize, and how much has been missing, or is short, for example? I'm just saying this because in most instances, we from civil society, we are more than willing to support, but we do not know how significant the challenge is, how much gap exists, and how much effort we need to put in. So in talking about compliance and issues of ownership, I would suggest that, yes, all of us have a role to play, but the Ghana Education Service should stick his or her neck out, and when I say the very specific, led by the Special Education Division, and drive the process. If it's about awareness raising, if it's about provision of uh, assistive devices and the rest, the Ghana Education Service, led by the Special Education Division, should come out and be the key stakeholder that should be held accountable for leading the rest of us to achieve what we put in the implementation plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Doctor? Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I believe we are privileged in this room to have the coordinator of the Inclusive Education Unit amongst us here. Yeah. At some point, I'm sure she will. Uh, speak to some of the issues. But I do want to wave to them so that they know you are <laughs> hiding in the corner there. Secondly, uh, talking about heroes and heroines, Seth Safako is my heroine, honestly. She has come pop, 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 pop. <laughs> At some point, her story must be told for all Ghanaians uh, to hear. So, madam, you always make me happy. Having said this, um, I the issue raised are extremely uh, pertinent ones about um, uh, compliance, sanctions, and so on. Uh, the lady will speak to it. But the thing about sanctions also is that the most important area is in legislation. So how have we performed as a nation in relation to operationalizing and implementing our Disability Act? Me, for me, that is one of the saddest commentaries in this country, where we are at with it and so on. Secondly, even getting the affirmative action uh, legislation off the ground, particularly with ensuring the disability uh, provisions within it, is also an issue. You talked about the, the policy indicating uh, about 18, very 18 categories. A lot of the categories deal with various forms of disability, which for me is extremely important because when people talk about disability in this country, they tend to lump it together. But it needs to be disaggregated because, they're like uh, Farua said, there are different needs, different um, requirements, and we need to understand that. But it's all it's about inclusion. That is why me I want us also to keep that um, very much um, in, in, in view um, in, in relation to that. 
Um, Madam uh, Moderator, if you allow me, uh, Safako, the issue of data has plagued us for a very long time, long, long, long time. It's very, very difficult to get a good national estimate on it. And one of the recommendations I made in my write-up is that even local authorities must, within their purview, know who and what and what categories desire as Ufuru has said. So even as we are relying on the good work that the Ghana Statistical Service is doing to reform and review its systems, at least I want localities to know what is going on even within their peer views. Finally, Auntie Rose, Auntie Rose, Auntie Rose, the woman, the, the, the child at the village. First of all, I talked about building the capacities of the various uh, departments of the uh, assembly. Social welfare are the people who go into the homes and know and can communicate and give them information. Therefore, they need that information. They need to be capacitated so that they can relay opportunities, encourage fearful parents, and help to break down prejudices. But I also want to say to the colleges of education, under your TTEL partnership, you have developed action plans and programs. You go down, you work with mentor institutions. You do your advocacy with the National Council for Tertiary Education. So I'm on your case, Auntie Rose. In, in the next one year, I'm going to follow you serious. And you and I know why I'm saying that. <laughs> I'm going to follow you seriously to see how your advocacy has worked so that I can support and champion. Okay. Um, so just to let you know that she's not the only one, but we're all on your case. So I'm sure you have. <laughs> So Auntie Rose will answer, Evans, I'm not skipping you. I want her to answer some of the questions and then we'll come to you. So Auntie Rose, please make sure you answer all the questions. Okay. Thank you. Kindly introduce yourself and your organization. Okay. I'm Rose Ofosuhima Daku, Inclusive Education Coordinator, Special Education Division of Ghana Education Service. Yes. We are the the caretakers of the policy. So we are taking care of the policy for all of us. And all of us here are stakeholders. I was so happy when our panelists said we need to own it. Our major problem is we not owning it. We are very sensitive to issues, but we fail to be responsive to the issues, and that is our major problem. The education is down there. People are aware, all of us are here are aware that inclusive education, this and this is what we need to do. And making schools accessible. This one, the person putting up the building knows that the school building needs to be accessible, but you construct steps and leave RAM, which is easier and cheaper to construct because the majority needs the steps, not the RAM. And that person is not owning to the fact that there are some people who will need RAM, and even all of us. We have a lot of issues drawing back the implementation of the policy because we do not own it. It is for some people, not all of us. So those people should. But if you read the policy carefully, the policy is making education owned by community. And all of us are members of that community. If a mother should send a child to a school for admission, then the head teacher says, I'm not admitting. This one I can't take care of because he thinks this one is for somebody, not him. If a parent decides not to send my child to school or my child is taken to school and what the child needs, I, every child will need exercise book and pen. But this my child will not need exercise book and pen. But what that child needs, that one is for somebody. That is another issue. What do we do? For the implementation of the inclusive education policy, 
we have done a lot. We started and we realized that some of the, the things that we need to put in place, for instance, the colleges of education, we have engaged them on how to prepare the teachers so that they can fit into inclusive classroom. For us to do that, there's the need for their curriculum to be reviewed, which is being done. So that the teachers will come out well equipped to take charge of inclusive settings. So that one is being done. Then the teachers in service, what do we do? And we shouldn't forget that all the teachers who have gone through colleges of education and universities that are uh, training teachers, all these teachers have been exposed to some form of inclusion. So we realize that it's not enough. We need to add on. So we develop insert model which will be used to train teachers because we have trained some of the teachers and we realize that they need certain things. After knowing the concept, you need the practice. All these things have been factored in that 200 page document which teachers are going to be used. Okay. Thankfully, UNICEF has supported us to print 50,000 copies of this. All right. Now, I'm coming. <laughs> so the last one. We have, <laughs> we have engaged Wayek to help us in making sure that children with special needs in schools are given the needed accommodation during examination. Now, Wayek is to give the needed accommodation during examination. But before the child should get to that point, there should be that accommodation in the schools. And for the child to be able to benefit from that accommodation that Wayek will give, there is the need for the school and the parents to make sure that during registration, all these things are factored in. For instance, Wayek is sitting somewhere, is ready to do that. Even to the extent that when private students register and they request for this accommodation, Wayek will send their request to the special education division for us to confirm for them, private students. All right, so thank those you so in the much. regular schools, we, the schools and the parents should insist that that needed accommodation has been factored in during registration. Other than that, during examination, if that child needs extra time, if that child needs to use a laptop, if that child needs uh, to use a recorder, yet that information was not given to Wayek. Right, thank you How so will much, Wayek Madam do that? Rose. So I, I'm, I'm sure she, she came very prepared. Are we satisfied with her response? Are we? All right, so now we have identified you. There's a lot more to come. This tells us that we need a lot of dialogue. It's not just a one-day event. And there's, we need to talk and own it. So today is about compliance and owning it. And she's tried giving her bits, but some people are saying they're not satisfied. So I'm sure when we're done, we'll meet her outside and then engage her more for more answers. But I, I did promise my colleague Evans to give him the opportunity. He'll be the last speaker. I meant, I'm, I'm so sorry, but we have to go shortly. But again, the conversation continues. So when we close, we'll have a lot more engagement on that. Evans, please All make right. it quick. Yeah, my name is William Evans Sinkuma here. I work here um, uh, with uh, Media General. Um, I think culture is good, culture is beautiful, it is what defines us. But when we realize that becoming inimical to uh, progress, that is where we find some level of uh, problem with it. Recently, we heard um, some, some, some issues from um, uh, parts of the eastern region that uh, people with albinism were being driven away um, and all of that. And I was wondering about, uh, uh, I mean, the, the children of these people. So what it means is that they will not have access to uh, education which has been enshrined under Article 25 of our Constitution. Collectively, what do you think we can do to change the narrative? Because yes, we have an entrenched uh, provision as far as our 1982 constitution is concerned, but people are just flouting it with, uh, let me say, alacrity. And then I'll take one last one, very last one from Johnny Hughes, and then that will be it. 
Thank you very much. I'm speaking from the perspective of um, Community Connect on 3FM 92.7. We've been very active, you know, in the Star Ghana program. Traveling along the country, we've come to realize, and this is just feedback I'm, I'm giving, we've come to realize that the level of inclusivity is almost absent for uh, girls who are of adolescent age. They build classrooms, there are uh, restrooms for teachers, there are none for the students. So even when it gets to the time where they have to swap their parts, they can't find any place to swap their parts and they can't go to school. That's excluding them from education. Number two, we've also noticed that there are too many pockets of empires within the disability front. Everybody wants to form an association and have a group. And so it makes your case weak when you are about demanding for what is duly yours because everybody has pockets of empires. Number three, we're talking about an increment right, for thank the, you, quickly. Johnny. We're talking about an increment for the 3% you know, fund, but we have not done an assessment of how much and how impactful the 3% has been. And it is because even the GFD rules does not have punishment in there. So before you ask for more, send your reports to them and make sure you're using the 3% better. Then you can come and ask for 5%. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Doctor? Right. Uh, Johnny, thanks. Um, a lot of this is, but I'm not asking for an increment in the 3%. I'm saying that the 3% should be the basic minimum that has been ring fenced for them. Oh, no, but, this is not for you. They, uh, they've been asking they, for yes, it on yes, the indeed. ground. So I'm just giving you feedback. Yes, indeed. But you, you are right. We need to assess what impact it has had. Yes. There are other issues about TEF and also divisions and about the adolescent girls are very, very well taken. I agree with you on a number of those kinds of issues. The issue about the, pace, the person with albinism, it's, it's painful and sad because, um, well, what we need to do is vigorous awareness creation. In my concluding remarks, I said to you that prejudice, stereotyping, and years of exclusion do these things. We need serious public education. We need also to be able to sanction people. We as citizens should be able to be bold, to take perpetrators, send them to Dovsu and other such places, identified places where people who are being, you know, molested and, you know, we need to be bold and take that step. And thirdly, there are role models uh, the, we, within albinism to the people who've done very well. We need to give them the platform to sell their issue so that parents can look at them and say, hmm, our child can be something interesting. We need to be up and doing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So to run off, I would mention um, one thing about the, sometimes the confusion around the disability groups. So we have what is the advocacy pressure groups, which are often not many. But we have also the service ones, which we could, uh, you cannot restrict because formation of organizations and groups, are, our, our, our constitution allows that. But the advocacy groups are distinct, and there are nine of them and they are members of the Ghana Federation of Disability Organizations. But the service groups are many, I'm saying it. So if we have this understanding, then we realize that it's not as weak as we think, but it's a, well, that is how people would want to associate, and we try to collaborate with all of them. I'm a member of the board of the Ghana Federation of Disability okay. Organizations, so I can wear that cap now. Diabolism issues, disability issues, awareness, it cannot be stopped. And advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. We can't stop. But we cannot do it alone. We need everybody to come and join. And I appeal that we take the message out. The market woman, the carpenter, the fisherman, the everybody, please be part of us. Just confer and consult with us so we say what is right and what is good. And then together, we can achieve. Inclusive education is the way to go. There are many out there that need to come in. And with all the things we talked about today, I believe that if you have the right political will, 
we change our attitude, we establish the ministerial coordination and give the funding that is required, we will make more inroads than we are doing today. Thank you that all of us are part of this struggle. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. And a round of applause. Um, let's do it for ourselves. That will be all for our open forum segment. I would like to say a very big thank you to all those who contributed by way of um, statements, comments, and questions as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Esther Ofea Abwaje, Chairperson, Steering Committee, Star Ghana Foundation, and then Mrs. Getrud Ofoewa, Fefuame Global Advocacy Advisor on Social Inclusion, Site Savers International, and a member of the UN Committee on the rights of persons with disability. We're grateful for your knowledgeable contributions. We're going to another very important segment and we recognize that um, you give a recognition where it is to you and I would like to call on Mr. Winfred Kinsley Afo. He is our Chief Operation Officer and also JM Shared Services. He'll be presenting some laptops to two of my colleagues who have stayed on Mission Ghana and made strides and their stories have gotten the most results for this year two of the Mission Ghana project here at TVC. So let's welcome our very own Portia Gabo and our cameraman, Philip Kachiku, as they come up stage. Applause, 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 please. applause please. So these two, that's Portia Gabo and Philip Kachiku, have worked on stories on Mission Ghana and their stories for year two um, has garnered the most results for year two. So Mr. Afol, our COO, will be presenting their laptops to them. And that's Philip Kachiku. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Afol, for this. So like... As a media organization, you know that we're committed to projecting issues in relation to inclusiveness. And we've made that promise to you. We're so grateful to Star Ghana, once again, Star Ghana Foundation. Shall we clap for them? We're so grateful for the support. And you also have been watching the second national public lecture on inclusive education, which was organized by TV3 Network and also the Ghana National Education Campaign Coalition. And before we go, we can't leave. Even though we've heard from Dr. Esther Fea Abwaje, that's the chairperson of the steering committee of Star Ghana, we also have someone who is ably representing Star Ghana here. And I would like to call on Eunice um, Adenyaga. She is with Star Ghana, and she is in charge of Jesse, and she's also a capacity manager with Star Ghana Foundation. Eunice, would we like to share? We would like you to share a word with us. Hello. <laughs> I want to do it from here. Is it okay? All I'm right. sure it's part of inclusiveness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Dr. Esther Ofe Abwaji, for asking me to give the remarks on behalf of Star Ghana Foundation. As the moderator said earlier, this is actually the second conversation we are having on the inclusive education policy. And it is an indication that it's a very important issue for us and to everyone that is gathered here because it affects our children, our family members, it affects citizens of this country. And we also believe that the right to education is a precursor to the realization of other rights. So it's very important. If you deny persons with disabilities of this right, their potentials for the future is hampered. So as Tagana Foundation, we 
we want to re-emphasize two things that we have already mentioned here. The first is that we recognize that our government, our country, is making efforts towards disability inclusion. So in terms of legislative frameworks, we can say that we have adequate provisions. We also recognize the second point, that there still remains a lot to be done. We have pockets of successes here and there, but we acknowledge that a lot more remains undone, and that is where we need to put our energies. In 2018, our government participated in the Global Disability Summit held in the UK. And our government made an eight-point commitment to strengthening disability inclusion in Ghana. And I think that our role as civil society organizations and different actors is to collaborate with the government to ensure that these commitments are fulfilled to the latter. One of the commitments is inclusive education, and that's a subject we have been discussing this morning. And the government mentioned three things that it would do to accelerate the implementation of inclusive education policy. The first one is that infrastructure will become accessible and not only physical, all the others. The second is that teacher training would embed disability inclusion. So teachers are equipped with all the pedagogy to engage and support persons with disabilities in their classrooms. The third is the promise to increase the budget allocation for disability, for, for the inclusive uh, policy. And the commitment is that by December 2019, we would be seeing a 1.5% of allocation directly to inclusive education of the education sector budget. And I think that this is something that we have to hold our government to. Because aside all the challenges we have mentioned, if there is a financing gap, no policy can be effectively implemented. And we have said severally that if we put enough funds into the implementation of the policy, we will be achieving much, much, much better. At the same time, we have seen a decrease in the budget allocation to the inclusive education. And that is contradictory. So in 2018, it constituted 0.3% of the education sector budget. In 2019, it dropped to 0.1% at the time that we are pledging to increase allocation. And we think that this is something to be having conversations with the, our government about or with. And we are at the time that we are preparing the budget for 2020. So it's important that we start engaging, dialoguing on a, a target basis, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Finance, to ensure that government meets at least this commitment it has made on an international platform. We understand as civil society and Stagana Foundation that budget allocation alone is not the solution. From that, you also have to monitor the disbursement and the usage. But at least we would have secured the initial step to having enough funds allocated to the right. implementation of the policy. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'm sure we would have a whole day to keep talking about this. but. We have to end it. And thank you so much, Eunice. We're grateful. Thank you so much. We appreciate it a lot more. And thank you so much to Star Ghana Foundation for making this possible. To all and sundry who participated both on site, um, online, on television, we're grateful to you. And to everyone here, thank you for making it happen. But before we leave, let's remember that we need to own inclusiveness and remember that inclusion is a right and not a privilege god bless us and god bless our homeland ghana thank you i am wendy lai